Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we engineer layer upon layer of weird and wonderful science directly into the substrate of your imagination. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this special edition, we visit the 2019 Bioengineering Innovation Outreach Challenge. For the challenge, high school students formed teams which came together to solve a problem in bioengineering and medicine. With help from mentors from Sydney University Academics. There were 36 teams from 15 schools around Sydney. Some schools entered many teams, and some students had fun with choosing their team names. The winner of the Best Innovation Overall Award voted by their peers was the St. Patrick's College Sutherland team for preventing bed sores with their intraflow cushion with infrared sensors. Bed sores can kill people by causing blood clots. Their cushion inflates to different amounts in different places under the patient as directed by the infrared sensors, so as to help blood flow, without relying on carers turning people that can't turn themselves. The students won a one-week immersive research experience at the University of Sydney during the 2019 winter school holiday period. The winner of the Australian Research Council Training Centre for Innovation Bioengineering Team Award for Best Presentation was the Merriweather High School team for their Universal Transformable Patch. This is a patch that administers drugs by microneedles applied to the skin with a mechanism on the outside of the patch to allow modules with different drugs to be slotted in so that the same patch can dispense different therapies while attached to the patient. One reusable patch, rather than many disposable patches, and one application of microneedles to a patient instead of many applications. They won a GTEC A10M mixed colour 3D printer. The Bioengineering Team Scholarship for Most Innovative Device was won by three teams from Sydney Girls High School. Team Bio for the Allergy Test. Their test looks for 10 genes related to allergy in white blood cells found in saliva. The mitochondria's team for their anti-fouling hydrophobic coating for heart valves to prevent dangerous coagulation. Team Let's Get This for their eczema pyjamas, a cotton onesie integrated with menthol for its soothing and anti-inflammatory properties, and sprayed with silver nanoparticles, which have antibacterial properties. The pyjamas should keep working for five years before they need to be replaced. The students win mentorship from the Centre for Innovative Bioengineering and its researchers at the University of Sydney, as well as access to labs to further develop their innovations. This scholarship is intended to provide adequate resources for students to publish their work in the annual Google Science Fair. Some examples of the other team's ideas for solutions to big problems include Our Lady of Mercy College team's EpiStrip applied epinephrine to the tongue for people suffering from allergic anaphylactic shock instead of the usual injection. Team Rogan from Kambala High School want to convert blood cells into stem cells to grow replacement neural hair cells to cure the most common cause of hearing loss, the loss of neural hair cells. Team Rubisco Shen designed a sealed greenhouse for crops that grow more efficiently. Plants sometimes use oxygen instead of carbon dioxide and instead of food, they create toxins as a result. By flushing oxygen out of the greenhouse, the plants can only use carbon dioxide to make food, so they're more efficient. As a bonus, pests can't breathe without oxygen, so you don't need to use pesticides. You'll hear more ideas from the students themselves later in the show. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet 
on www.diffusionradio.com. The inspiration and coordination for the Bioengineering Innovation Outreach Challenge came from Professor Hala Zrikat. She's a Professor of Engineering and Director of the ARC Centre for Innovative Bioengineering. She gave the opening talk for the day, and later we met in her office. I began by asking her, what is the aim of the centre? This is a centre funded by the federal government. The idea here is to train the next generation of biomedical engineering, not only in research, but also uh, in areas where they can translate their discoveries from the lab and the bench to take it to industry or the clinic. And what about your work? So the work we're doing in the center centers around musculoskeletal regeneration, which is regeneration of bone, cartilage, tendon, and muscles, muscles or even soft tissue as well, such as skin. To do that, we develop synthetic material. My own work is developing synthetic material that is materials that we can make in the lab that is not biologics. And we can use these materials to replace damaged tissues in the body. Here, for instance, bone, damaged due to disease or uh, trauma. If you have missing bone, you would replace that missing bone with the synthetic materials that we have, and then we can see that bone will grow into it, new bone grows into it, so the material will encourage the development of new tissue, in this case bone, and eventually the material will just degrade, excreted from the body via normal physiological processes, and new bone is formed. And what are the synthetic materials? For the, again, for the bone tissue, the synthetic material is made of ceramics, in this instant calcium silicate, that we modify with ions or trace elements that we know are important in bone formation. In the instance where we develop tendon and ligament, again, we use fibers there. We incorporate into it synthetic items that we know will facilitate the development of the synthetic material to adapt and comply with the requirements of a tendon and and ligament that is being very strong, tough, and able to regrow cells onto it. And what sort of techniques do you use? The centre is unique in that we have multidisciplinary teams. So we have the engineers, the chemical engineers, the material scientists, the biologists, the mathematical modeling, the 3D printing people with expertise in 3D printing, all working hand in hand to develop the materials we develop. It's not a single technology, it's not a single expertise. So it's cross-disciplinary? Very much so. That's all I work on. I sit in engineering, I'm a biologist. And you also talked about regenerating muscles? Yes, we are also working on regenerating muscle. As you know, if you have a blast and you lose your part of your leg, you're losing soft tissue as well, not just bone. So there is a work with companies as well. So we have with the center five companies involved in that, working on technology that the company wants to develop. In this instance, we work with Osseo Integration and they do a lot of amputees and developing uh, implants to help the amputees walking again. And as you know, when you have amputees, you're not only regenerating the bone, you also need to regenerate the soft tissue, the muscle. So we're working on that. We're also working on developing cardiac patches. Cardiac patches, muscles, it's just resembling the muscles. We're also working on developing uh, patches for skins to heal the wounds. And what do these patches do that's different to bandages? This is early stage, the patch development, and it's one of the PhD projects in the centre under my supervision where we are aiming to, again, reflecting the multidisciplinary nature of the group, developing a cardiac patch that is very strong, that can withstand the beating of the heart, but at the same time encourage the heart cells to grow on it and do the function that they were expecting it to do. And do you have patches for wounds other than the heart? 
for yes for skin. For skin as well. Yes, we're working on that, and that's another big aim of the center. We're also trying to develop 3D printed implants for personalized use. So the idea is you have a patient coming into the clinic or into the surgery. There will be a room next to the surgery where the patient will have their wound scanned or the defect scanned. And then that will be then mathematically modeled, fed into the 3D printer. The computer language is then fed into the 3D printer and ask it to print the material using that defect geometry and then place it straight into the patient. And this is the beauty of not relying on biologists but, ra- but only relying on the synthetic material to regenerate the tissue. We do need funding. We have great talents in Australia. We don't want to lose them. We also need to be in a position where we can recruit more of these talents from overseas. So we need to facilitate the immigration process happening in Australia for talents. Well, Hala Zikrat, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Professor Hala Zrikat, Director of the ARC Centre for Innovative Bioengineering and Coordinator for the 2019 Bioengineering Innovation Outreach Challenge. And now to a busy buzzing hall full of students and mentors at the presentation day at Sydney University. I spoke to some of the students and some of the mentors, starting with Dr. Gurinder Singh. My name is Gurinder Singh. I'm working as a research fellow in the School of Biomedical Engineering, Sydney University. I mainly work on to develop some new material for to treat the cancer or all kind of brain disorder. So we are developing a tiny nanoparticle system which can like act as a submarine and target two particular cancer cells and then can be killed by not surgery but kind of like you applying an external magnetic field and they have some local heat and heat can kill the cancer cell. So we're developing some sort of non-invasive technology. So I basically work with the developing next generation of material, how we can cure the cancerous disease. And you're working with some of the high school students here? Yes, I'm working with the high school, Sydney Girls High School students. There are two groups I'm mentoring there. So they are trying to develop some kind of device which can communicate your motion to the brain cell. So it could be technology could be helpful. The children or adults have eclipses, or the some have some disease kind of Alzheimer, Parkinson, so they can stimulate this the, the the dead cell in order to to develop their regain their memory. Thank you. My name is Swara and, and uh, I'm Leslie. So our focus was going to be on epilepsy, specifically like a form of epilepsy known as absence seizures, which are most common in young children. So why we wanted to focus on this was because often there isn't enough like physical symptoms like muscle spasms, etc. that you normally see in seizures. Like in absence seizures, it's like often mistaken as daydreaming in young children. So we wanted a definitive measure to like detect if an absence seizure was actually occurring. So our design would be a monitor, I'd like to be worn um, almost like a headband. To make it minimally invasive, we would have it worn behind the ears and go behind the back of the head. That way, so it wouldn't like be too obvious or like too intrude into like the wearer and they'll be able to wear it more, like constantly. And it will like, you know, have sensors, brain sensors to sense the electrical activity within the brain. And that will be transmitted to say an app we've designed and then they will be able to track their brain activity over a period of time so they can see any trends or patterns of, say, the brain activity to track, like, maybe the seizures and see if they have medication, if the medication is helping reducing the duration or sever- severity of those seizures. Um, and so, like, the main target, like, audience for this would be, like, young children and also those, like, with severe disabilities and, def- like, developmental disorders because it's often even harder for them, like, to be able to tell if they're having a seizure or for others to tell if they're having a seizure. The app will be able to notify, say, a parent or caregiver that you know, their child seems to have like abnormal brain activity, check up on them to see you know, if everything's okay, if they are having a seizure, to make sure they're out of like harm's way. Because in case they're doing like an activity which can cause them to say if they have a seizure during it can be dangerous. Say like if they're yeah, swimming or maybe like crossing a road or something similar where they have to actively be participating in. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm Maria Tuyol and I come from Mount Carmel Catholic College. I'm Maria Louise. I came from Mount Carmel Catholic College. I'm Alicia Sayalaga, also from Mount Carmel. Uh, I'm Elisa Tepavong from Mount Carmel. <laughs> I'm Anora and I'm from Mount Carmel as well. <laughs> so our design is, oh, it's a watch technically. And so it detects like the nutritional deficiencies. And when you, when someone wears it who's like, let's say, iron deficiency, it can detect like when you're sort of getting, it's like it's getting worse in a way and what foods you need to consume. So it's like to reduce the repercussions of like diseases coming in, so, so on. And so how does it detect the deficiency? So we created this like biosensors and it's underneath the watch which yeah, analyzes the sweat. From using that, it can just, the watch is able to show the user what's happening and like how to you know reduce its impacts and stuff so the reason <laughs> the reason we decided to create the watch because we wanted people who's out there get access and like access to these type of things and it's more i suppose more convenient for example if someone needs to get a blood test they don't have to travel to the doctors they can just use the watch and say this is what's happening this is what you need to do well oh, thank you very thank much you. So we are Team Discovery Channel from 4th Street. This is Felix Fan, Tracy, our leader, Christy, Angel and me. We're, I'm Tim Sidorenko. And we have two teams coming from 4th Street. Yeah, so that's who we are. And our project is called the EpiPlant, which is an epinephrine implant, which, is, which solves the problem of having to carry around a bulky device like an EpiPen with you everywhere you go. So an EpiPen is about 15 centimeters by about three centimeters, which is, you know, not, not everyone can carry that around versus having an implant which is about one by two by three centimeters, relatively flat. The case would have rounded edges, so it's non-intrusive. And that could be activated through a bracelet with a radio transmitter and the implant would have a radio receiver, which with a specialized code so that it doesn't just activate every single implant in the area. And that's basically the general idea. So the main problem would be the fact that epinephrine expires after 18 months. And so this idea isn't for people who have frequent attacks, frequent, uh, that go into shock a lot, because then they'd have to change the device very regularly versus people who are just at risk, but they don't always get it because then they can have this implant for 18 months without even having to think about it and every 18 months they have to change it at the GP, which is pretty sanitary. And what inspired you to choose the project? Personally, for me it was the pregnancy implant, which lasts for three years and is a substitute for taking the pill every single day, which is kind of the same as having to carry around an epinephrine pen with you every single day. That's the inspiration, mainly. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. I'm Matilda Longfield and I'm currently in my first year studying a PhD and I've been involved in this as a student mentor. And who are you mentoring? So I'm mentoring two teams, one from Sydney Girls High School and one from Pimbles Ladies College. Um, both have come up with amazing innovations and worked really, really hard on this project and I'm very impressed with both teams. I'm excited to see them present later today. And what's involved in mentoring the teams? So we've just had email correspondence, they've been able to ask me questions, I've given advice, uh, tried to steer their research efforts and make sure that they're you know, looking broadly around the whole, the whole topic and understanding the problem that they're trying to solve. And how did you come to be involved? So I actually am friends with Ben Ferguson who was involved through being part of the research group with Hala. So I heard about it through him and, and got involved because it sounded like an excellent initiative and I love the idea of inspiring and exciting young people to get into medical innovation. Would you like to say a few words, Ben? So my name is Ben Ferguson. I'm a first year PhD student at the ARC Training Centre for Innovative Bioengineering. The reason why I got involved in this is that it's all about breaking down barriers between senior researchers who can be quite intimidating to go up and talk to and it, it can be quite hard to sort of for these high school students to have the courage to go up and, and approach them and so that's what this event's all about. It's all about trying to sort of connect the senior level researchers 
who are at the cutting edge of their fields with high school students who could easily and, and do want to develop a passion for these types of things. A big part of the mentoring of the students was it was all about training them to develop two things, which was to first identify a medical problem that's going on in the world. That's the most important thing is because you can't have a solution without a problem that exists. And so the first thing that they had to do was really sort of do their research and find out just what is Australia's medical problem going on. For example, we have an aging population right now. The rates of, for example, arthritis are increasing through the roof. And that's something that really affects a lot of people. And so in firstly identifying a problem, and then they also have to be able to come up with an innovative solution to that. Think about what are the existing alternatives out there and what about our solution could be better. And so that was sort of that sort of framework of thinking is how we would mentor the students. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So my name's Lucia Wakem from Sydney Girls High School. And so our project is mass producing like scorpion anti-venom because right now it's like it's really inaccessible to most people and it costs a lot of money. For example, like it can cost up to $62,000 per treatment. So we've used the idea of using hybridoma technology to mass produce scorpion antivenom. So that's essentially fusing B cells from living organisms, such as mammals, for example, like rats, and fusing them with like cancer cells so that they can proliferate and just continuously rapidly produce more and more cells. So that means that there would be this like mass amount of monoclonal antibodies which could be used to treat scorpion stings for example. Fantastic and what inspired you to look into that problem? So we were all kind of researching and we were really unsure as to what to do and like in our research we we sort of started delving into like into animals and like animal bites and stings and then we found the scorpion sting and we saw how much it costs and how like unavailable it was and then we, we were kind of moved by this article of this mother and her child was stung by a scorpion and she had to pay like 32000 just for a treatment so her son wouldn't die and that was in Arizona which is like a pretty well developed area so we thought if this is the issue in like well developed areas such as Arizona it could be like the issue in undeveloped areas as well such as like Sahelian Africa or something like that so we were just really inspired to try and like eradicate this problem so then we did more research and found this hybridoma technology was used for other things. Fantastic, thank you. My name's Vivian and this is Bushra. Um, we both come from Sydney Girls High School. For this project we wrote, we researched about waterproof hearing aids because right now the hearing aids are only water resistant and they aren't waterproof so yeah that's what we thought we would do. The thing was post plasma deposition which is basically like a process where you fire high-powered electron beams into the target material. Clearly the target material, we are combining two substances to make it. The first one's synthetic foam, which is like hollow, it has tiny hollow particles in its structure. The hollow particles would be made out of tempered glass and it allows the air to be dispersed more, so it makes it lightweight. So synthetic foam, it, it can also withstand really high pressures, so if you go underwater, it should be fine. And then, and also really low temperatures, so cold water. And the second substance we're using is fluorinated silica nanoparticles. Basically, these are super hydrophobic, so that means when a water droplet touches it, the contact angle is greater than 150 degrees, so it basically just rolls off, making it waterproof. So when you combine these two substances to make a coating for the hearing aid it's basically a waterproof hearing aid. How long did it take you to work on the project? We didn't get a lot of time around like 10 days since we started so we did have to do a lot of research and stuff but Young was our mentor so he like helped us like understand the complex principles of making the um, waterproof hearing aid so it was like good. Terrific thank you very much. Congratulations to all the students for their wonderful ideas and their amazing presentations. You can see photos of the students I spoke to on the diffusionradio.com page for this episode. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? 
Do you have a science outreach grant that I should apply for? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends, follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, 2XXFM in Canberra, and my local station, 2RDJ, in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man, knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits Photography, collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.